Uh, what a honor and privilege to be here at Parul University. So I want to thank the Vice Chancellor and the President, Dr. Devan Patel, and the faculty members and students for spending your morning to listen to what I might have to say. So what a great honor and privilege. And uh, when they read my bio, I always feel a little embarrassed because they often blew it out of proportion and raised the expectation to the extent that one might not able to live up to it. So if I disappoint you, then uh, don't blame me, blame the person who read my bio, okay? <laughs> but this is my first time in Gujarat. And I'm very excited and also feel very privileged that I was just handed the autobiography or biography of Mahatma Gandhi. So I, I'm in the land of Mahatma Gandhi, the land which gave birth to a great leader who advocated and who spread the mes message of Ahimsa all over the world. As you know, His Holiness Dalai Lama is an admirer of and follower of, of Mahatma Gandhi, and we Tibetans also follow Ahimsa, nonviolence, as our path to seek our basic freedom. And also, I'm in the land of Sadar Patel when uh, Tibet was occupied by the Chinese army. Sadar Patel was the leader who almost prophesied what will happen if Tibet is occupied, the security threat that India will face in the coming decades to come. And if you read his speeches, if you read his letters, written to then Prime Minister Pandit Nehru and others, it's prophetic. All the things that he warned had come true. And obviously I'm in the land of present Prime Minister Modi ji. And I was told that in 2014, his constituency was this place, and he won the largest vote in 2014. So because why I say this is the government of India and the people of India has done the most for Tibetan people in our struggle. So we are very grateful to this great land and loving and kind people of India, for which I want to say shukriyada or Hardik Shukriyada. Now I was told on the way that the topic I was given is uh, journey of Tibet through my journey, something like that. So I'm an ex tempo speaker. Of course, I've spoken on various topics. But I'll uh, try to connect Tibet with India and in the context of present India-China relationship. Now we all believe in law of karma, takdir. India and Tibet were bound to be together. But it was not Tibet who sought India. India came to us. Do you know the story? A million years ago, 100 million years ago, Indian plate, the Teutonic ship. India was part of Africa, more closely to Madagascar. It broke off, came all the way, and connected with Tibet. So it's been 50 million years. So Tibet was actually a very fertile area, plain, low land, vegetation, forest, everything was growing. But India came, the tectonic shift pushed Tibet up and up and up. 
So now Tibet has become the tallest. It's called the roof of the world because all the of the hundred tallest mountains in the world, 92 or 3 or 4 are in Tibet. Because why? India kept pushing us. For the last 50 years, still pushing us. <laughs> so India came to us. They said, we have to be together. <laughs> then uh, Tibet said, okay, very good, you are coming to us. In 7th and 8th centuries, Tibetan kings and rich people, they patronize scholars. Now in any country, normally the national heroes are normally the generals who fought wars or the presidents. Maybe in Gujarat is an exception, maybe a businessman is a national hero of Gujarat, maybe. <laughs> it's in the genes of Gujaratis, right? But for Tibetans, our translators were the heroes. They were called Lotsawas. Maybe Tibet is an exception, where translators were heroes. Why? In 7th and 8th centuries, the kings and the ministers, they patronized great scholars and were sent to India to learn Sanskrit, to learn Buddhism. Why they were called heroes is if 10 scholars were sent to India, 7, 8, 9 died on the way because of the climate, because of bandits, because of the forest wild animals. But one or two survived. They came, they learned Sanskrit. Then they learned Buddhism. Then they translated Buddhist texts into Tibetan and took it back to Tibet. So we brought Buddhism from India. Now so many people talk about Nalanda University and we all know Buddha is a great man. Yes or no? Yes. But do you know that in any of the Buddhist countries in this world now, you will find one dozen or two dozen volumes of what Buddha said. But only in Tibetan language, you will find 300 volumes of what Buddha and his closest disciples said. We have been the best student of Buddha. India is a guru, but you will never find a student like us. Now, if you want to know what Buddha said, if you want to know what his closest disciples said, it's only in Tibetan language now. So one of the initiative of the Indian government under Prime Minister Modi ji is to translate all those Tibetan texts into Hindi or Sanskrit now. Because India doesn't have those volumes of what Buddha said. So we connected, as I said, India came to us. We took from India the knowledge of Buddha and preserved it very well. And also, what is in Tibet? Lord Shiv, many people in India worship. Yes or no? Yes. But mythically, yeah, mythically, some say Lord Shiva never came in the form of human being. But we all believe Lord Shiva, mythically, lived in Tibet. Mansurobar, Lake Mansurobar, Mount Kailash is in Tibet. Yes or no? Yes. So Tibet also is a sacred site for Hindus. So that's how we are connected. And not just that, Tibet is also called the third pole. After Antarctica and Arctic, Tibet has the third highest reserve of ice. And the difference is Antarctica and Arctic, when they melt, it forms ocean. But when the ice 
and snow of Tibet melt, it forms streams and rivers. Hence, 10 largest rivers of the world, or at least in Asia, are in Tibet. Now, Indus River, Satlaj River, Brahmaputra River, Ramu River, Nepal, all flow from Tibet. So for hundreds of years, we never charge for our water. Nowadays, if you sell water, you make lots of money. Presently, 1.4 billion people in the world depend on water flowing from Tibet. Had we charged one billion, one dollar, per person, we'll be making one billion dollar a day. That would have made us the richest country in the world. But India taught us Buddhism. Karuna, Maha Karuna, Daya Karo, Bharte Rao, Bharte Rao, Bharte Rao. <laughs> and now also the term India comes from Indus River. Hey, If you go to Indus River, 40% of water of India is a direct glacier or snow melt of Tibet. 40%. Which means 40% of Indus River is Tibetan water. Which means, you all are studying MBA in business, which means we have 40% claim over Indus River. Meaning we have 40% claim over term India also. Copyright to hoga na? So each time Indian cricket team wears India, 40% is us. <laughs> so we are connected, yes or no? Yes. Spiritually, environmentally, historically, in a good way. And nowadays, everybody likes Momo, yes or no? We brought Momo from Tibet to India. So you, look, you go to every corner of any town, small towns and cities, you'll find Momo stalls. With due respect to Prime Minister Modi ji, he wants to generate youth employment. But I think Momo has generated more youth employment <laughs> than any government scheme at the moment. Again, hey. And prayer flag, Tibetan prayer flag is very popular. You like motorbikes, you have cars, all have Tibetan prayer flags. And it has Om Mani Padme Hu. It's a Tibetan prayer. We believe that as prayer flag flutters, it brings good luck and good business. So I think the growth of India's economy also coincides with the popularity of prayer flag. In 1980s, prayer flags started becoming popular. Now it's very popular. Exactly the same time, India's economy also, with good luck that prayer flag brought, is growing and growing. So more prayer flag you buy, more momos you eat, you're contributing to India's economy and bringing good luck. So this is how we all are connected. And my personal journey, I was asked, I travel 50 to 60% of the time. And uh, I grew up in a very small village, I went to Hansraj College, where Shah Rukh Khan went, by the way, and uh, to Campus Law Center. And I got Fulbright Scholarship and went to do my master's degree at Harvard Law School. I did my doctorate degree there. Very difficult, very challenging, but I, ma I managed. And then I was fellow and senior fellow there for seven years. So altogether, I spent 16 years. So in 2011, I was elected. So I left uh, America. And I continue to work for Central Tibet Administration even today. And I travel 50 60% of the time. But I travel, I have the title of a president, but I travel on economy class. No business class or first class.
and my salary is only 30,000 rupees sekam. Can you believe that? Why? Because this is a labor of love for me. Because I am in, we are in the freedom struggle, like Mahatma Gandhiji led the Indian freedom movement. So it's a labor of love. You sacrifice to contribute for the greater good. Why I don't travel with business class, all my ministers don't travel with business class, we think, we believe, we are saving that money so that we can send five or six students to university. Why we take less salary is because we can take care of our elders, we can take care of the sick, we can take care of our children. And this is actually an old Indian ethos. Service to help others. You don't walk, you don't come to this world for yourself, you come for humanity. Others before self. Hekine. So we have been a good student, huh? we learn from Indian ethos, we are practicing it. And some people have forgotten it. But. And the, in the last eight years, the challenges are many, because wherever I travel, the Chinese government is obviously not that happy. And they issued press release condemning my visit. I went to South Africa. I was scheduled to give a talk at a law school. And the Chinese embassy issued a press release saying, get out of South Africa. I was, I was thinking, how can they say that? South Africa is not their country. But they wrote a press release saying I should get out of South Africa. And I was scheduled to give a talk at Ellen Bosch Law School in, in, out, in the outskirts of Cape Town. 100 Chinese and migrant laborers that they hired came to protest. I was speaking at University of Toronto. 50 or 60 Chinese students came with national flag to protest. But nonetheless, I travel everywhere and I uh, give talks. I go to Washington, D.C. I meet with uh, Speaker, Madam Speaker Nancy Pelosi, the senators, congressmen, people in the government. I go to Brussels, meet with people in the European Parliament. I go to Australia. I go to Japan. Japan has the largest Tibet parliamentary support group, 92 members. Czech Republic has 51 members. So that way, we have a lot of support around the world. And my job is to create awareness. At the moment, Tibet is ranked by the Freedom House as the least free region after Syria. We all know about Syria. But how many of you know that for three years in a row, Tibet is listed as the least free region, second least free region after Syria? Religious freedom is denied, human rights violation is going on, and environmental destruction is going on. So Sadal Patel said in 1950s, if Tibet is occupied by the Chinese army, then India will face security threats. And if you look today, you can clearly see the border incursions that's taking place from Ladakh to Himachal, all the way to Kashmir, to Arunachal. Before, Tibet acted as the buffer zone between India and Tibet. By the way, Tibet is a huge territory. Yeah? Tibet is as big as, we can call two-thirds of India. It's 2.5 million square kilometers of land. It's as big as Western Europe. So it acted as a buffer zone. Because after the occupation of Tibet, now the Chinese army have moved right into the border of India. Before, there were hardly any sepoys. It was more of a, less than a police border. Police patrol the border. Now it's an army border. Indian government spends billions of dollars protecting the border. 
When Tibet was independent, it was not required. The billions of dollars could have been spent on education of Indian children to help the poor. Now you have to spend on the border. And also because after the occupation of Tibet, now China's relationship with Pakistan, China's interference in Sri Lanka, Maldives, Bangladesh, you can name it, even in Nepal. All this happened after the occupation of Tibet. So that there's a direct correlationship with the loss of, in, loss of Tibet to China and India's security. So it's still ongoing. So let me conclude because I was told to speak for 15 to 20 minutes. Let me conclude by saying India's national security is at stake. And Tibet is vital in this context because you have 2,500 kilometers long border between before, between India and Tibet, now between India and China. So I hope you all will pay more attention, study more, analyze more, and understand more. Let me conclude by giving one example. After the occupation of Tibet, 98% of Tibetan monasteries and nunneries were destroyed. 99.9% .9 of Tibetan monks and nuns were disrobed from practicing Buddhism. In 1950s and 60s, Buddhism as we knew it did not exist. Physically, monasteries were destroyed. There were no monks and nuns. But after 60 years, Thanks to the government of India, we have rebuilt monasteries after monasteries, brick by brick, in India, Nepal, and Bhutan, mainly in the state of Karnataka, Himachal, and other places. Also in the whole of Himalayan belt, from Sikkim to Bhutan to Nepal to Himachal to Arunachal Pradesh to Ladakh, Buddhism or Buddhist civilization have revived compared to the 1960s. And oddly, China has become the largest Buddhist country in the world. 300 million Chinese follow Buddhism now. India is called the land of Buddhism, but presently China has more Buddhists than India. And good thing is, even in Tibet, the government policy is to destroy and demolish monasteries and nunneries. But in private and social space, Tibetans are practicing Buddhism in Tibet too. So Buddhism has come back to Tibet. So that's why let me end on a positive note, saying some people say, what are your chances of success given the power and influence China has? We all know China is very powerful, but spiritually, the Chinese army destroyed 98% of monasteries and nunneries, but 60 years later, we have rebuilt Buddhism in India in exile, but also in Tibet. And also, China has become the largest Buddhist country in the world. So spiritually, we have already won. Politically, we have to make some efforts, but India took 200 plus years but under the leadership of Gandhi, Ahimsa prevailed against the British Raj. And we do believe same Ahimsa and nonviolence under the leadership of Dalai Lama will prevail once again. And we will succeed. Till then, let us be together. Thank you very much.